Okay, this event is being recorded and it will be posted on the Kansas City, Kansas Public Library YouTube page. Um, please keep yourself muted during the presentation. There's going to be a couple of points in the presentation where we will have Q and A. If you have questions, please put your questions in the chat, and then I will ask uh, those questions of Dr. Serta. Um, so, just to give you some background on uh, Dr. Serta, Dr. Daniel Serta is a city planner specializing in urban design and community planning, and he currently serves as the Economic Development Program Officer for Local Initiative Support Corporation, or LISC. His presentation about Armourdale is based primarily on work he began 30 years ago at Harvard College and that he expanded upon in his master's thesis at MIT. As he will explain, his original research drew on books, maps, photographs from the Kansas City, Kansas and Kansas City, Missouri Public Libraries, uh, the Wyandotte County Museum, the Unified Government's Archives, the National Archives here in Kansas City and in Washington, DC, along with the Kansas and Missouri Historical Societies. He also did extensive work in the manuscript collections of Harvard Business School, the Harvard University Archives and Libraries, and the Massachusetts Historical Society. Dr. Serta is a native and a resident of Kansas City, Kansas. So welcome, Dr. Serta. We are so glad to have you with us this evening. And I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Anne. Can you everyone see my screen? Yes, the okay. picture of Armadale. Okay, great. I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, apologize, I've, I have had a couple of little technical glitches, including for some reason a momentary interruption of my uh, internet connection a minute ago. So I'm going to keep my video muted while you're looking at my screen to make sure you get that information. Uh, I want to thank Anne for helping to coordinate this lecture. Uh, today, as most of you probably know, is the 70th anniversary of the 1951 flood, which devastated not only Armourdale, but most of Kansas City. It erupted water supply, disrupted and dislocated tens of thousands of people and caused over a billion dollars in damages. Um, that's not gonna be the primary topic of my discussion today though. What I really wanna talk about is Armourdale itself, its history and how to think about its history. And what I wanna do is start with the notion of history itself and why we care about history, how we think about history. And I would start by creating a distinction here. It's a little bit of an academic distinction. And that's the distinction between um, memory, excuse me, and interpretation. Historians deal primarily in the realm of interpretation, interpretation of evidence, way of looking at patterns, way of looking at events, and also thinking about not only how individuals recall events, but how collectively the public has memory and thinks about the past. So let me give you a quick example of that. The recent debate over Confederate statues is very politically charged. To me, it's largely a question of memory and interpretation. It's a question of the deliberate act of deciding what is worthy of remembering and commemorating. And I offered that caveat at the beginning just by way of saying that that is the nature of history. That is really the essence of history. It is an applied art. It is a uh, social science in many respects. It is a craft. But at the end of the day, it's fundamentally about finding something useful in the past, deciding to commemorate it, deciding to understand it, and deciding to use that to think about our current circumstances. One of the primary reasons I uh, reached out to Anne in the library for the opportunity to speak about this is because as many of you might know, and if you don't, you need to know, there's actually currently an effort underway right now by the Unified Government to create a new master plan for Armourdale. And one of the long threads of discussion I've had with the consultant team that's working on that, I personally am not directly involved, except as a citizen. I actually still own my mother's house in Armadale. I grew up down there. But a long thread of conversation I've had with them is that to me, it's really impossible to understand what the future ought to be in Armadale without having a very deep and profound understanding of what the past is. I think that's particularly true of people like me that grew up there but I think that's especially true of decision makers. And that's why I asked to give this presentation today. So let me start with how we often think about the history of Kansas City. Go back and look at early histories of Kansas City. And they're really consumed with one fundamental question, which is why Kansas City? How did Kansas City become the major metropolis of this part of the United States? How did it become sort of the, the gem of the Missouri Valley? 
the way that that story is traditionally told focuses on what you're looking at, which is an image of what's called the Hannibal Bridge. It was the first railroad bridge constructed across the Missouri River anywhere in the United States. It was built uh, starting in 1867 and was completed and dedicated on July 4th, 1869 to great fanfare. This is a uh, hand rendering. There are actually photographs even of the opening. There was hot air balloons that went up from the shores and uh, a great celebration that happened when the bridge was dedicated. There is three decades or more of history of Kansas City that focuses on this event and really characterizes it as a cunning decision on the part of local business leaders who marketed Kansas City, who sold its natural advantages, who sold its superior location and its ability to create and become the city uh, that it eventually did. But there's actually a different side to that story that I want to focus on, which is that that might be a little bit of a glossy tale. It's not just so much that the city of Kansas City emerged because of the bridge and happened. It did population balloon from just several hundred people who had settled here uh, by the uh, 18, late 1860s, just after the Civil War. But Kansas City was actually a terrible place to build a railroad, let alone a city. And the reason for that is because it's a very hilly terrain. It was not uh, really the optimal location for siting a bridge across the Missouri River, nor was it necessarily the best location for locating railroads and particularly building the infrastructure around rails roads, not only a transportation, but a freight and a manufacturing and all of the industrial activities that would be encompassed in a 19th century city. So why and how did it happen? Well, I'm gonna make a claim today that I hope to support through my presentation, which is Kansas City became a city because of business strategy, because of its location, but it became a city especially because of Armourdale. That's a claim you've probably never heard anyone make. And I know that because I've studied it for a long time and I'm the only person that's been bold enough to make that claim. But let me tell you why I make that claim. It's because Armourdale and the establishment of Armourdale and particularly the economic role that Armourdale has and actually continues to play in the life of Kansas City that has made Kansas City uh, that initially in a very early period in the 1870s made Kansas City the industrial center that it became. It made it the distribution, manufacturing, warehousing, transshipment point of the Midwest. And it happened specifically because of a concrete set of investment decisions that were made by specific business leaders, though not necessarily the people you might have in mind. There was nothing preordained about there being a city at Kansas City. What happened instead was a whole series of decisions over the course of a couple of decades that cemented its role into place. And part of that story, as suggested by this image, has to do with that vacant area. I don't know if you'll see my pointer when I point at this, that oxbow up there of the Kansas River, where just where it meets the Missouri. That is what became Armadale. And in this image, which is actually a uh, bird's eye perspective rendering that was done in the late 1860s, around the time that the bridge opened, you see the beginnings of the industry that carved out what became what we know as the neighborhood of Armadale, but at one point, what was the city of Armadale? So how did this come about? Well, I'm not going to go back to prehistory, except to say that it's important to know from the time of first white settlement in the state of Kansas, that is Kansas opening as a, as a territory for settlement in 1854, Armourdale was located in a very geographically uh, advantageous place. And it has an early history that is really worth telling. This is the earliest survey that I've been able to identify of what became Armourdale. This is conducted in 1855. Uh, by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. It's a survey of what existed on what became Armourdale then. I will just highlight a few things here. You'll see obviously the oxbow of the river I mentioned. If you see these little lines drawn at the top, these are paths. They're basically roads, early roads. What you don't see is where they continued across Armourdale. This was at the time of the survey, land that had been deeded barely a decade before to the Wyandotte Nation by the United States government when the Wyandots were relocated uh, to what is now Wyandotte County, Kansas City, Kansas, back in 1844, 
This is land that was actually taken from other Native American tribes that had similarly been uh, relocated here, uh, the Delaware tribe uh, specifically, and the Shawnee who had an allotment on the south side of the Kansas River. But this land was actually settled and was being farmed by members of the tribe when the survey was undertaken. If you can see this here, it says Silas Armstrong cornfield there to the west. And in the center, it actually says Widow Armstrong. So that's a woman named Lucy Armstrong. Who's, I've got a photo of here. Click up, there we go. That's Lucy Armstrong. Uh, she had a farm in the center of what became Armadale. I point out those paths because they're important. We often think about infrastructure, particularly transportation infrastructure, as something that happened only after the industrial era, and particularly after white settlement happened in the West. But these paths were carved out by earlier Native American groups, uh, first the Kansas, then the Delaware and the Shawnee, across this bottom land to ferries that crossed the Kansas River as early, at least as the 1820s and 1830s, that's documented, possibly earlier than that. Those ferries crossed near the location of what we now know as 18th Street Expressway, and just a little east of where 7th Street Expressway crosses the Kansas River. So for nearly two centuries, there have been people crossing the river at the locations, although at that point it would have been in boats. Native Americans, put the first transportation infrastructure in place. And this diagonal line across Silas Armstrong's cornfield in particular, keep, keep that in mind as we go forward because that becomes important later on. So I mentioned, sorry, this is not going forward, sorry. I mentioned uh, the fact that the survey was undertaken in 1855. Well, what happened in 1854, Kansas territory is part of the Kansas-Nebraska compromise, you might remember. Um, was open to white settlement. And the Native Americans were given a choice. The Wyandotte specifically were told, you can either relocate to Oklahoma and maintain your tribal status or become US citizens and remain. That actually created a rift in the Wyandotte tribe that persists to this day. They split roughly in half, half of them stayed and continued to own land and sold land. And actually some of them became very wealthy in the process of selling that land. But by 1870, when this survey was conducted, they hit apportioned off and sold most of the land in the bottoms to various farmers and property owners who owned it. That path that I referred to earlier on Silas Armstrong's farm became formalized as a road that the county built that ran diagonally to the Southwest across what we now know as Armadale and reached what was called the County Bridge or sometimes referred to as the Old Southern Bridge. That path we now know as Argentine Boulevard, but Argentine and Armadale didn't exist at this period in the 1870s. So how did they come into existence? Well, they came into existence right after the railroads arrived in Kansas City. So let's go back to the bridge. How did the bridge arrive in Kansas City? Well, the bridge arrived in Kansas City, more accurate telling than what is typically told in the local history, which focuses a lot on a handful of land speculators uh, in Kansas City who, who really marketed the city to the group of people who I'm gonna explain to you made the actual decisions. That decision was made principally by a railroad group of investors that were based in Boston, that had operations in Detroit and Chicago, and that were building railroads across the West, including the Union Pacific. And the Boston syndicate was headed by a gentleman, whose photo is shown here, named uh, John Murray Forbes. The Forbes group, as it was referred to, ended up owning an entire railroad empire across the United States West in the late 19th century called the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy system. And it was this group that Kansas City leaders approached in the late 1860s and pitched the idea of building a bridge. Forbes was actually not interested at all in what became Kansas City and building a bridge here. But he wasn't the on the scene manager. That was this man, this man named James Joy, who was his manager in Detroit. And Joy uh, was intrigued by this prospect for reasons that I'll get to in just a moment. But actually it was a decision that ran counter to his relationship with Forbes and eventually it was his undoing. In other words, James Story deciding to build a bridge in Kansas City ended up being him, leading to him about five years later being fired from the syndicate and no longer being a part of it. But Forbes was uh, basically a Boston trader whose family had made great wealth in trade, overseas trade with China during the 18th and early 19th centuries. And he was backed by other similarly situated Boston Brahmins, like this gentleman, whose name was uh, Horatio Hollis Hunnewell. His wife's last name, maiden name was Wellesley, and he founded and established the town of Wellesley, Massachusetts. 
Honeywell was one of the richest men in New England. His estate was renowned for the gardens there. Uh, and it's still known to this day because those gardens were eventually dated to Wellesley College, which still maintains them to this day. Nathaniel Thayer, the gentleman shown here, was another member of the syndicate. So collective, you have this almost sort of Dickens-like cast of characters in Boston, Detroit, and Chicago that made the decision to invest and locate the bridge in Kansas City. They were part of an older generation that was born in the early part of the 19th century. But they also had, men, they were mentors too and had apprentices in the form of a younger generation of Bostonians, men like Charles Francis Adams II, who's shown here, who became really the most instrumental person in the story I'm going to tell you about Armadale. Charles Francis Adams, as you might guess, was a direct descendant of the two Adams that had been president. Uh, John Quincy Adams was his grandfather. His brother, Henry Adams, became very famous as an American historian. But Adams himself was a businessman and a very adventurous and some would say even foolhardy businessman who got very interested after the Civil War in investing in Western cities, in railroads, and uh, nearly lost not only his own fortune, but most of his family's fortune. Um, but that being said, in the 1870s, he got very interested in Kansas City after the bridge had been built. And specifically with Mr. Joy, Mr. Thayer, Mr. Hunnewell, and Mr. Forbes, became an important investor in not only the railroads, but other affiliated ventures you'll hear about in just a moment. So why would these people in Boston, of all places, decide that this forlorn place at the intersection of two rivers in the middle of the, what became the continental United States, why would they decide that Kansas City was an important place? Well, again, it wasn't because of the salesmanship or the cunning of those local leaders, but in fact, it was because the Kansas legislature in the 1860s had decided that the growth and expansion of Kansas was really going to rely primarily on the expansion of railroads. These investors were very interested in building railroads across Kansas specifically to reach the Gulf Coast and the Southwest. It was the idea of creating effectively a railroad head for an entire network that attracted them to what became Kansas City. And Charles Adams in particular was interested in the prospect of investing in other affiliated industrial concerns. And he took as his first object of interest, a small company was called initially the Union Stockyards, but that he reorganized as the Kansas City Stockyards Company in 1871, along with the other gentleman you see here as his financial backers. What you're looking at here is a woodcut uh, drawing of the first 1874 livestock exchange in Kansas City which was located in the West Bottoms, but actually on the Kansas side of the state line. So it was in Kansas City, Kansas, that uh, Adams planted his flag, so to speak, in 1871. And he invested nearly half a million dollars of capital, $100,000 of which was put up by himself and his brother and the remainder by the other gentleman I just showed you. But he also was very interested in investing in other real estate and other industrial concerns in Kansas City. Now, Adams never relocated or lived in Kansas City. He was in Boston the entire time. He did visit uh, periodically, maybe every several years. But he needed someone on the ground to manage these investments for him. And to manage these investments, he hired uh, an associate of his, someone he'd known since childhood and with whom he'd served in the Civil War, a gentleman named Charles Fessenden Morse, whose photograph you see here. Morse is a really intriguing and interesting character. He had served with incredible distinction in the Civil War. He actually led his regiment at Gettysburg. He was best friends with Robert Gould Shaw, who's renowned as the leader of the first black regiment, the 54th Massachusetts, which has been commemorated in books and films. They were best friends growing up and they had a heavy correspondence during the Civil War. It was actually the basis for the movie Glory were the letters that Charles Morse wrote to his best friend, Robert Gould Shaw. Morse himself, after the Civil War, uh, because he had been trained as a civil engineer and had worked in logistics and in supply, the supply chain of the Army of the Potomac uh, during the Civil War, was a master logistician and, and became very interested and eventually ended up working for several different railroads in the Midwest. In 1874, Adams reached out to him for the first time about potentially coming to Kansas City. Morse couldn't at the time, he was actually in Topeka leading what would become known as the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railway. 
which was at the time being assembled out of a constellation of small paper railroads that had been chartered in the state of Kansas uh, and, and elsewhere. Um, eventually though, Morse did prevail, uh, excuse me, Adams did prevail on Morse and encouraged him in 1879 to relocate to Kansas City. Morse had his own financial connections in Boston, namely with a man named Henry Lee Higginson, you see here. This is a photograph that actually hangs uh, on a wall at Harvard University. I actually saw this photograph for the first, or painting for the first time when I was uh, an undergraduate there. But um, Higginson, again, was one of the wealthiest men in Boston. He was actually the founder of the Boston Symphony. And he was very intrigued by the work that uh, Morse was doing, but specifically the prospects for investing in the railroads. And you know, as you can imagine, any of these folks were very interested in the prospect of building even greater wealth. So between them, uh, what you see here uh, are people who were directly involved in capitalizing, expanding, and strategizing around the railroads that had arrived in Kansas City and all of the affiliated industries, manufacturing and distribution that sparked up around them. This is a bird's eye view of the West Bottoms. And if you ask anybody in Kansas City about the West Bottoms, what most people know is the stockyards were located there, the packing plants were located there. What a lot of people don't realize is that there were a whole variety of affiliated industries that were the economic backbone of what became the Kansas City metropolitan economy during the late 20th century that were all, excuse me, 19th century that were also located there. What did those include? Those included companies that were doing things like fabricating steel, wire, bolts, nuts, household goods, agricultural implements, tools. All of these raw materials were being brought to Kansas City and manufacturing was happening here. But you remember, Adams had invested principally in the Stockyards Company. And the Stockyards Company had a very peculiar predicament, which was that its only real purpose and function when it was established was to remove livestock, live animals from trains, quarter water, feed them, and then put them back on the trains to ship them away. In fact, the Stockyards Company could only charge fees uh, for any livestock that were actually transacted or sold on the Kansas City market, which is why Adams had established a livestock exchange here. So he asked Morse to figure out a way, identify a strategy by which the Stockyards Company could increase its growth and potential. And the idea that Morse came up with, which again would seem logical enough, but it wasn't, it hadn't happened yet in 1871, was that if the Stockyards was only going to make profit on livestock that were actually bought and sold in Kansas City, you needed to do something to increase the demand for buying cattle in Kansas City. And how better could you do that than to actually build out an entire industrial district that was populated principally by the primary users of live animals, the slaughterhouses that would render those animals and turn them into food for human consumption, right? Those uh, industries had already been well established in the 1850s in cities like Cincinnati and Chicago, but they had not yet really located at any meaningful level in Kansas City. Adams and Morris got together and Morris took him over to the land that became known as Armadale on a rainy day in March of 1879 and told him, this is what we're going to do. We're going to build a town here. And according to Morris's own account, Adams looked at him and the quizzical look and said, why? <laughs> this is marshy, muddy swampland. Why would we possibly locate a town in the oxbow of, of this river? And that really is the essence of the dilemma that you know, lies at the creation of Armadale that persists to this day. Why build a town or an entire neighborhood in the floodplain of a river, a minor river, where it approaches a major river? where it is prone and known to be a, a likely location of flooding. Well, again, there's a short-term versus a long-term perspective. And the reality is this is where there was cheap level land available in Kansas City. As I mentioned before, Kansas City was a very foreboding, very hilly town. And by this point in the late 1870s, land in the West Bottoms was selling for roughly $1,000 an acre in, in 1879 dollars. By contrast, the farmland that Morse had already scouted out and was well aware of because he was building uh, on the opposite side of the Kansas Yard, uh, River, what became the Argentine Santa Fe Yards in the town of Argentine, uh, which he was also a founder of. Land in this bottom, which was now undeveloped at the time, was available for $50 an acre, barely one twentieth 
of, of the cost of the land in the West Bottoms. So it took some controlling, but Adams was convinced. And let me explain to you how significant a decision this was between these two men. At the time that Morse convinced Adam in that spring, wet spring of 1879 to build this town, this became the largest single real estate venture in the history of Kansas City, would be for almost 50 years until J.C. Nichols began to develop the country club district in the early 1920s. Morse identified an area of over a square mile, dozens of acres of land, about 80 acres in total, that would begin in the first phase of Armourdale. And they ex anticipated building an entire functioning town. Now, at the time, developers, if you wanted to call them that, really traded primarily in land, not so much in the construction of buildings and improvements on that land. But they did lay out the actual plan and the grid of streets and public spaces for those towns. And they expected Armourdale to be as significant as an important a town as, as any of the ones that they were familiar with, whether it was the Back Bay of Boston, Charlestown, or Wellesley, as I mentioned before, many of the industrial towns like Springfield uh, and other places in Massachusetts they were familiar with. They laid out an entire grid of streets, some of which respected earlier contours and early important paths, like that diagonal road that went to the Southern Bridge that became Argentine Boulevard. But they also laid out in the center of that town grid, a public square. Shawnee Park was the only equivalent to the Village Green of New England that you can find in any early plans anywhere in Kansas City. There were small parklets and squares in some other parts of Kansas City at this point, but until the Kansas City Park System was being developed in the 1890s, more than 15 years later, Shawnee Park was the largest planned park anywhere on either side of the state line in Kansas City. And again, it was testament to the city planning ideals that these gentlemen had. But as I mentioned, the real strategy here was to get the Packers to locate here. And how better to do that than through flattery? Morris already had an established relationship with uh, Simeon Armour, the owner of, one of the owners of the Armour Brothers Packing Plant. They had a small operation in Kansas City at the time. And he and Adams offered to name the town after the company, if they would locate a new plant there. As you probably know, they did not build their plant in Armadale, but the name stuck. And uh, it was through that flattery that they also built out the relationship with the Armors and other Packers, like the uh, Schwarzschild in Salzburger, which built at the southeast corner of what became Armadale, Swift, which built at the northeast corner, uh, immediately uh, adjacent to the river next to the Kansas City Stockyards. So by the early 1880s, as you can see in this map, Armadale was already positioned, not simply as a speculative real estate venture, but as a functioning industrial town, which was part of the heart and the industrial core of all of Kansas City. In fact, almost every major packing house that located in Kansas City, with the exception of the Armour Brothers plant, which was near the uh, intersection of the Kansas and Missouri rivers, and then was relocated to uh, center, Central and James Street uh, later in the 1890s. Every major packing plant in Kansas City was in Armourdale. And in fact, the, the stockyards themselves not only expanded into the east end of Armourdale, but Adams and Morse purchased land at what would become the west end of Armourdale for a future expansion and land in Argentine for yet another anticipated expansion that never materialized. Armourdale itself became a major thriving town. And as I said, really became the industrial core and heart and the backbone of industry in Kansas City. In addition to the packing plants, there were related enterprises that the Caw Valley uh, Townside and Bridge Company that these gentlemen chartered to, to build the town actually owned and operated. They had a desiccating works, which took the remnants, the unusable remnants from the slaughterhouses and converted them into fertilizer. They owned a chemical company on the west end of Armourdale uh, that uh, took chemicals that were uh, being imported from Colorado into Argentine and refined those chemicals. They also encouraged other major industries to locate and purchase parcels in the city of Armourdale. And that included affiliated industries like soap making plants, 
And again, I won't get into all the gory, gory details, but as many of you probably know, soap used to be rendered from not only lye, but from animal parts, right? And so there were a lot of uses made of the various products that came out of the slaughterhouses. As Upton Sinclair famously said back in the late 19th century, the Chicago packers used every part of the pig except for the squeal. And pork was also a large uh, part of the livestock uh, that moved through the Kansas City market uh, and a very important part of all of those associated industries that grew up. There were also other implement makers, as I mentioned before, there was a company called the Kelly Cooperage, which was established in the 1880s and persisted in Armadale until the 1950s that made barrels, again, largely for packing and uh, shipping meat, uh, specifically uh, dried and salted meats. Uh, again, this is in a period before there was refrigeration. Uh, so there was a whole range of industries that concentrated in this flat grid of what became the city of Armadale. It became a major, major component of the core of industrial Kansas City. Now, that being said, why don't you hear about Morse or Adams or others? Well, because they didn't live here. Even Morse, who was Adams' agent in Kansas City, lived not in Armadale, but on Quality Hill near 8th in Pennsylvania. And then later, he was one of the first investors in and one of the first homeowners in what became known as Hyde Park, a very exclusive subdivision that was built in the countryside at the time, outside of the town of Westport. Now, of course, a neighborhood within Kansas City. But Adams and Morse's plan really succeeded splendidly. And it was the growth and the explosive growth, not only of the railroads, but all of those affiliated industries you saw and the stockyards themselves that accounted for the explosive population growth and employment and economic prowess of Kansas City as one of the fastest growing and largest cities in the American West by the 1890s. Um, I have some data I want to share real quickly. Uh, again, it's an old scan of a printed, you can believe that, chart that I made back in 1992, I think. But what it shows is that um, the line uh, you want to look at is the blue line. And so if you see over in the bottom left-hand corner, the proportion of, of cattle sold that were being transshipped through Kansas in 1870 was very negligible. When the stock yards opened in 1871, it jumped up to about 35% were being sold here in the local market. But with the incremental increase starting in the late 1870s and into the 1880s and 1890s in local demand fueled by the growth of the packing houses and all of those associated industries, the proportion of cattle that were being shipped through Kansas City that were actually being sold on the Kansas City market and in turn making profits for the Kansas City stockyards grew proportionally and really explosively. That very bright line you see in the middle, it represents the opening of the Omaha stockyards in the mid 1880s, which grew similarly in similar fashion. People are often stunned when they see this image as part of the promotional uh, flyer that we put together for this event, which is that Armadale was a bustling mercantile town. It had a population of 10,000 by the 1890s. It had hotels, it had hardware stores, it had multiple uh, dozens of groceries, it had apartment houses, it had um, uh, you know, all, all kinds of entertainments, taverns uh, loca located there. It had boarding houses. It had uh, saloons. It had, well, adult entertainment. Let's say that. It was a very rough and kind of rocking kind of place in the 1890s. What changed that? Well, what changed that is what we know happened in 1951, but it also happened in the late 19th century. I mentioned before, the you know, the other plants. Here's the Colgate Palmolive and... and uh, and associated uh, distribution facilities. This is photographs from the 1940s, but again, most of these companies were established by the 1890s. And the stockyards company itself had expanded so much that they had built a new headquarters, a uh, new livestock exchange in 1896, as you see here in this image, and then that eventually outgrew that building and had to replace it with another building that was built in 1910, the building that's still there today. The growth of the stockyards themselves was a function of the growth of Armadale. And the growth of Armadale was a function of the growth of the stockyards and of Kansas City. Kansas City was also uh, obviously a, not only a major transportation network, but it had its own local transportation systems. And many of you know, Kansas City used to have one of the most extensive streetcar systems in the country. What you probably don't know is it's attributable to the same people we're talking about. Charles Morse in 1886 bought out local, several locally owned horse-drawn streetcar companies 
And with financing primarily from Henry Lee Higginson and Nathaniel Thayer Jr., reconsolidated them what they called the Metropolitan Street Railway System. This train you see here, I don't know if you can read the caption above it, uh, but the last name uh, destination on there is Armadale. From Armadale, you could travel to Argentine, to the west, or to the east, into the West Bottoms, up the 9th Street incline, and then as far east as Independence, if you decided to, on the Kansas City Metropolitan Street Railway, which was electrified and then converted to cable cars uh, by the early 1890s. Again, a function of the same investors and the same business strategy that was largely about locating and building up a town populated primarily by the workers in all of these major industries and, uh, and uh, tied into those associated industries. The city itself, Marmordale, uh, again, was incorporated, as you probably know, and, and agglomerated into what became Kansas City, Kansas in 1886. But it grew and it prospered during this period. Shawnee Park became the real centerpiece of the entire town. It was a beautiful uh, sort of Gilded Age park. I had a very large shelter in the center, what was in the center of the park. Um, the population grew sufficiently that there was not only one school, the Armordale School, which was built uh, originally in the late 1870s, but eventually three schools. Morse School, named after Colonel Morse, after Charles Morse, John Fisk School, which is still in operation. And then eventually there was even a segregated African-American school called the Phillips School, which I've never been able to locate a photograph uh, that was built uh, in the 1890s. So again, this all changed. What changed? What settled it? Well, what changed was the creation circumstance of Armadale, the fact that it was built in this oxbow, in this floodplain of the Kansas River. And so that brings us to the Great Flood of 1903. And I'm going to only talk briefly about the floods, though I have a lot of images of them. I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, what happened in 1903? Well, it's really interesting. There are really, I think, two or three things to take away from the flood of 1903. The obvious part being that uh, Building a town <laughs> and allowing it to prosper for over a decade was always effectively playing Russian roulette with nature. What happened in 1903 is that there was a really unseasonably wet spring. It started in February, March of that year. It just kept raining and raining and raining. And by the middle to the end of May, uh, there was actually routine pulling of water and floodwaters, uh, probably you know, several inches. Uh, gathering on the streets of Armordale every time it rained. That was a function basically of the absorptive capacity of the soil in Armordale. Uh, Armordale is what would be referred to by natural ecologists as riparian lands, which are lands that are basically typically inundated and that have a very high water table below them. Um, but it was interesting how this was perceived because by that point, Armordale was advanced enough and industrialized enough that there were actually an active sewer system. And there were people that blamed the sewer system for backing up and letting water get into the streets when it was in fact simply the fact that the ground was saturated. And this was probably not necessarily the best place in which to locate a town. These images that you're looking at here are actually of a bank, a major bank in Armadale and the hotel that you saw in the earlier postcard image. This is a view slightly further down Kansas Avenue. Um, the 1903 flood was devastating. It was the highest flood on record going um, to the entire documented history. Based on local folklore about the flood of 1844, it probably exceeded the flood levels of the flood of 1844. That's not certain. That's still held out by folklore. It's probably the most devastating flood in Kansas City. But it just absolutely tore apart the fabric of the town. It devastated commercial businesses and it especially devastated homes. These homes you see uh, in this image are actually some of those that were in better shape uh, because they were more substantially constructed. Many of the houses simply floated away. There was a survey done by two builders after the flood and they determined that there were over 1800 homes that couldn't be found. There were about another 600 standing um, that were in need of substantial repair. And there were another two or 300 homes that they documented that they couldn't identify where they'd come from. They were just there in Armadale. They might've come from Argentine, <laughs> might've come from somewhere further upstream, but they were not from those original sites. So long story behind uh, the flood control measures and responses to the 1903 flood that I don't have time to get into, but I wanted to highlight a couple of, of details that are important here. The first is that 
1903, there was this massive flood, which was the first real, uh, you know, sort of human tragedy in Armadillo, Kansas City, devastated both sides of the state line. And in fact, there was an observer who came to Kansas City from New York, who wrote in a local newspaper at the time, that the flooding that he saw here was actually worse than the Jonestown flood, which he experienced firsthand. Uh, the in inflation adjusted terms, it's estimated over a billion dollars in damage happened as a consequence of the 1903 flood, and that probably on the order of $750 million of those damages happened in Armordale alone. The builders that I mentioned before uh, made estimates uh, that were based basically on the reconstruction cost of the homes that were uh, uh, damaged. And I've uh, run those forward into 2021 numbers, and it would be the equivalent of about $180 million in damage to residences. But again, they weren't counting for things like the personal possessions or the fact that, you know, home sta building standards today are obviously much different than they were back in the 1870s. There would be a you know, much higher building standard and a much higher level of finish and detail in a, in a contemporary home today. Many of these homes were very modest and very simple. But it wasn't simply the fact that the flood of 1903 happened. There was an immediate response, a relief effort to support people who had been displaced, but there was also a concerted effort to rebuild. And what's interesting is it was flooding again the following spring in 1904, and then repeat flooding at almost the same scale in 1908 that began to cast a pall and a question of whether it even made sense to have people living in Armourdale, let alone have industry located there. Colonel Morse himself was interviewed uh, in, after the 1903 flood, and he made some very crass comments, and all of which I'm going to quote, but, but I will tell you that some of which was he said, it's entirely possible that Armourdale really isn't suitable as a place of residence. Perhaps it should simply be a place for industry in the future. Again, those are words that were spoken in 1903 by the man who developed the town. And they're words that resonate today as we'll get to and go forward. The image you're looking at here is an image of the Kansas River where it approaches the Missouri. You can see Strawberry Hill on the horizon there. But one of the direct consequences, and the one that I will note that's really important and significant in the history of Kansas City, is that in 1905, the Kansas legislature chartered the Caw Valley Drainage District, a levy authority that had the authority not only to control um, and provide for flood protection in uh, the channel of the Kansas River, but specifically the authority to condemn privately owned property. And that was contested heavily. These images were taken in 1908 because one of the areas of focus that the drainage district made from the outset was on the fact that the Stockyards Company itself had actually been reclaiming land from the river. And there's legions and legions of newspaper stories from back in this period that blame, uh, where the public blames the Stockyards Company itself for effectively creating not only the circumstances that led to the 1903 flood, but also the 1904 and 1908 floods, because by reclaiming this land, narrowing the channel, and then depositing refuse from the operations of the packing companies and the stockyards into the river itself, the argument was made that they had effectively uh, limited the flow of water through the channel and it created circumstances that were more prone to flooding. Ultimately, the Stockyards Company lost that fight. It went all the way to the United States Supreme Court. The authority of the drainage district was upheld as a public safety measure and the Stockyards Company had to retreat, but it was heavily contested for five to 10 years. I'm gonna to get to the point where I'm gonna transition and I wanna see if we have questions up to this point, uh, but I wanna close with a couple of thoughts about this period in history, because as I mentioned before, the establishment of the city of Armourdale and Armourdale is a strategy for building specifically the profits of the stockyards company, the wealth of the people that established it was really at the core of why not only Armourdale grew and prospered, but also why, as I said earlier, Kansas City itself did. There's another aspect of the story, again, that wasn't well known until I researched this back in the early 1990s, which is that the transformation of Kansas City related by these individuals related not only to Armourdale itself, but really to the entire system of transportation infrastructure in this region and continues to shape us to this day. One of the most significant things that Morse and Adams did, and again, remember, Morse had been the superintendent of the Santa Fe Railway in Topeka was they began to plot railroad investments that were about relocating the railroads out of the West Bottoms and building entirely new trunk lines around Kansas City. 
at the time that they started doing this in the early 1880s, the south end of Kansas City was roughly at about 17th Street. So it's in what we call the crossroads today. Beyond that, it was the countryside. Again, this, the town of Westport was across the country, uh, you know, across a lot of rural land, uh, you know, a few miles away from what was Kansas City back in the 1870s. But they began plotting specifically to locate a railroad at the south end of what was then the city. It became known as initially as the Beltline and then eventually as the Kansas City Terminal Railway. Why was it called the Terminal Railway? Because in the early 1880s, Morrison Adams had actually started to scheme to relocate not simply the railroad infrastructure, but the passenger station, the Union Depot, which was located in the West Bottoms and which was devastated by the 1903 flood, to the south end of town, to what we now know as Union Station. And in so doing, they accomplished this not simply by getting the railroads to build the station where it's located, but more specifically, they did this by helping the railroads build an entirely new trunk line to Chicago through what we now know as the Kansas City Terminal Railroad uh, right-of-way into the Santa Fe system that made the Santa Fe system uh, the, 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 the real trunk of what is now the Burlington Northern uh, Railroad system. So again, that's a little bit of a footnote to the story of Armordale, but my point here is that they had a really indelible impact. Both of these men were in their 70s by the time that Union Station was dedicated uh, in 1912. And they both retired around the same time, 1914. Morris returned to Boston where he lived out the rest of his life until he passed away in the 1920s. Adams uh, died a few years before Morris did. But um, that kind of creates a transition to an entirely different chapter that leads up to the 1951 flood. And I wanna take a, a moment here just for a couple of questions. And then I wanna spend most of the balance talking about the run up to the 51 flood and how we think about Armordale today. So um, I, I neglected to say earlier, and I told you, if you have questions, if you could uh, type them in the chat or uh, click on the raised hand uh, icon, if we have that. So there's a comment here that says, uh, knowledge of, of police fire layoff, then suit in 1904. That's a question. Uh, my great grandfather was laid off and shot as a security uh, as security at Packing House. He died a month later. I, I don't know anything about that specifically, but I will tell you there are stories and stories and stories. There was a lot of labor activism in Armadale uh, starting in, in the 1880s. And there was a lot of violence associated with that. Some of it instigated by uh, the packing companies and, and the railroads themselves. Uh, Morris himself actually right before he relocated to Kansas City in 1879, put down a major strike by engineers on the Santa Fe Railroad. And often that was done by bringing in the Pinkertons, right, private detectives uh, who were really renowned for the violence and, and labor conflicts and, and strife. Um, there was a labor strike of some sort in one of the industrial enterprises in Armadale probably every two to three years between the early 1880s and the turn of the 20th century. So uh, I'm sorry to hear that happened to your grandfather, but the, those stories are there. And again, I, I think, you know, one, one thing that sort of pains me is I uh, had the privilege through my education. I grew up in Armadale. I might have mentioned that before. And uh, again, it's a whole other story, but I somehow managed to eke my way into Harvard. And it was by doing that that I discovered the basis of the entire story and the people who are involved with it. But I also um, know that there's an entire set of hundreds and dozens you know, of other stories that need to be told about people that lived in Armadale what life was truly like there in the better part of the last almost 150 years now since it was established. And are there others? I, you're muted. Sorry, still can't get the hang of this. <laughs> um, this one says, great information. What were the political factors that determined the direction in which the city core would grow? Well, you know, there weren't that many. I, I mean, the primary political factor that I mentioned was the Kansas legislature giving away the grants of railroad land that attracted investors to Kansas City because it was seen as a portal into Kansas. One of the larger points that I would make about that is that, you know, part of the underlying basis of my argument is essentially that Kansas City has always been a bi-state metropolitan economy. It is today. It was at its founding. That hasn't always been acknowledged. Obviously, people still like to talk about the, the border wars in the earlier period in the, in the Civil War, uh, 
and not just about sports, right? We hear talked about in terms of incentive policy. Uh, there was a lot of politics back and forth about every range of thing you can imagine. One of the more interesting stories that I heard in the process of this, I actually heard it from both Adams and Morse's grandson. Uh, Charles Morse had a son who married, uh, excuse me, had a daughter who married one of Charles Adams' sons. And they had a child, a man named Thomas Boylston Adams, who was in his 80s at the time that I did this research. He's long since passed away. But Mr. Adams actually told me the story that um, Charles Morris was sort of, you know, his most profound arch enemy in Kansas City was William Rockhill Nelson, who was the publisher of the Kansas City Star, because Nelson was renowned as a progressive reformer. And Nelson was constantly scrutinizing the Stockyards Company, the investment decisions they made, the way that they had an impact on Kansas City, and the fact that, frankly, they had a lot of influence over local aldermen, uh, especially in Kansas City, Missouri. So again, there are a lot, it's just the same way I was saying before about, about the lives of individual people on the ground in Armadillo. There are a lot of ins and outs about the politics and the political influence that these major corporations had that still really have yet to be told. Um, that hasn't been a special focus of my research, but, but I, I certainly know that they're there. Any others? Uh, one more, okay. what ethnic groups were populating Armadale prior to 1900? Oops, <laughs> sorry. I, I think I muted myself when I started to talk rather than unmute myself. Uh, in, in the period right before Armadale was settled, there were actually a lot of German uh, farmers that had located uh, in Armadale. As many of you know, uh, you know, there were Eastern European immigrants, Croatians and Serbs in particular, as well as uh, Lithuanians and Poles, who were recruited by the packing companies. And many of them did live in Armadale. Many of them relocated to higher land like Strawberry Hill uh, after uh, the 1903 flood. Uh, it was in the 1890s, however, that the first major employment of African-Americans in industry in Kansas City happened in the West Bottoms and in Armadale. And there was actually a small settlement of African-Americans who lived in Armadale uh, that were also dislocated by the 1903 flood. As we'll talk about in just a moment, Mexican-Americans started to migrate and locate in Armadale uh, in very large numbers uh, right after the turn of the 20th century, but I'll get to that in just a moment. Okay, do we wanna go ahead? I think that's it for questions for now. Okay, we'll move forward. This next section is drawn largely from my master's thesis, which was really about the whole idea of city planning and how Armadale was emblematic of the processes of city planning. Um, again, I'm going to mute my video. I'm just worried my, my internet might get a little clogged up here. Um, there's a mo movement in the early city planning movement in the 19 uh, teens and 20s. It's referred to as the city efficient. And the idea was it was a perspective on thinking about a city, first and foremost, as not just an economic engine, but what you might call a fiscal engine. What does that mean? That means that by the turn of the 20th century, city governments had started incrementally taking on more and more responsibility, not only for infrastructure, but for other public goods and services. In an early period of city building, again, up to the time that Armadale was being established, the powers of local government were very, very limited. Primarily, they provided police protection and they provided some basic very, very minimal level of services in terms of maintenance of existing infrastructure. Developers, property surveyors, landowners would deed over public rights of ways like streets, but they would not improve them. So Armordale had bare streets or simply dirt roads. Uh, and it became incumbent upon the city to actually raise money through to property taxes to do things like pave the roads, build sidewalks. They initially built them out of wood planks and then uh, by the time of the depression started building them out of brick uh, and then providing for other public services uh, like modern utilities, waterworks, electricity, gas before that. Um, cities typically took over ownership and responsibility for that. Cities had always had policing responsibilities and there was always concern, particularly in working class neighborhoods, that the costs of providing police protection in areas with large working populations were disproportionate uh, to the tax uh, valuation of those areas. Uh, 
So this is where this idea of the city efficient comes from. It's an idea that was proposed and, and, and really propagated by a number of very influential planners. But I want to talk briefly about two of them that actually came to Kansas City, Kansas in this period, starting in, in the teens and 20s of the, the 20th century, about 19, uh, 19 and, and 1923 specifically. The gentleman you're looking at is a man named Thomas Adams, who's actually British. He was an early land planner in England, but had a lot of influence in the United States in the late 19th and early 20th centuries on what's referred to as the Garden City Movement, which is ideal uh, kind of bedroom community, uh, suburban community kind of development model. I mention Adams here, not because he's so inherently interesting, but because in 1921, the Kansas City, Kansas Chamber of Commerce actually invited him to speak and to take a survey of the city of Kansas City, Kansas as part of their efforts to promote the first city plan for Kansas City, Kansas. And Adams came to Kansas City, Kansas. He gave a speech uh, after a couple of days of being here, which he outlined some of his general findings to the Chamber of Commerce. And he noted specifically the prevalence of poor housing conditions in the industrial districts, namely Armourdale. Um, not much happened after that for a couple of years, but eventually the Chamber of Commerce uh, recruited one of the most esteemed American planners, a gentleman named Harlan Bartholomew, who had profound influence, not only on the actual development of city plans throughout the United States, but on the entire logic of city planning. And again, that's what I wrote about in my master's thesis uh, at MIT. I wanna sum it up in a very simple way to say is that the city efficient ideal was at the core of the work that Bartholomew uh, did, but it really had profound implications for places like Armourdale and, and similar neighborhoods in other cities around the country. The Bartholomew firm ended up doing work not only in cities, major cities like Richmond, Kansas City, Kansas, St. Louis, but by the 1940s and 1950s was planning new major cities like Honolulu and Los Angeles uh, and uh, Atlanta, Georgia. Um, he did work throughout primarily the Southeast and, and the Southwestern United States, but also in the Midwest. And again, this is a, a diagram from, from Richmond, Virginia, uh, but there are similar diagrams uh, that he did for Kansas City, Kansas and Armourdale, where uh, Bartholomew was one of the first planners to use what we now call geographical information systems or GIS, mapping systems, where data are actually mapped to geography, where specific parts of a city are broken down into at least neighborhood areas and are analyzed on the basis of different factors like housing conditions, demographics of the population, property valuation, and sort of contrasted and compared in terms of the costs of services there relative to the tax revenues that were being generated by, by those areas. So in Richmond, Virginia, as you can see here, there are areas that were noted, uh, the areas that are darkly shaded as having very substandard housing conditions uh, by happenstance, that convention also reflects the fact that these are areas that typically were populated by racial minorities. In the city of Richmond, these are largely African-American neighborhoods uh, that had more substandard housing conditions. Um, Bartholomew's work followed by about a decade, some research that had been done by a sociologist from the University of Kansas, uh, who had come to Armourdale to specifically study uh, what was happening on the ground in Armourdale, excuse me. And he had noted uh, specifically that there was a prevalence of really substandard housing conditions, uh, although there were some more affluent areas within Armourdale that had some nicer housing. Many of the areas, especially of working, worker housing, were in very poor condition. Many of the uh, children within Armourdale had higher incidences of infectious disease. They had lower access to healthcare. They had lower access uh, to quality food, it starts to sound like a whole constellation of public health problems that still uh, plague some uh, urban areas today. But this was one of the first periods in American history where planners began to systematically look at and evaluate and try to devise strategies and interventions for these areas. Now, the one major shortcoming, again, wrote an entire thesis about this, and there are lots and lots of books that talk about this, but I'll, I'll sum it up in a simple way which is to say the real shortcoming of this planning approach is that almost all of the interventions, almost all of the strategies, almost all of the solutions that these planners devised were physical planning solutions. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is they either proposed taking down substandard housing and replacing with newer housing, or just as often 
dislocating the populations of people who lived in areas like this in the hopes that they could find better accommodations in the private market. Again, this was still a period where there were not necessarily public resources or public authority for local governments to necessarily do things like rehouse people. That didn't start to come together until the uh, New Deal during the Great Depression when the federal government actually started funding public housing, for example, and other major uh, city building initiatives. But back in the 1920s, Bartholomew and his planning staff put their lens on Armourdale and began to look at these issues and basically made a determination following in the footsteps of Colonel Morse, that in all likelihood, Armourdale was not fit to serve as a residential district. It should largely serve as a commercial and industrial district. What's really, to me, most interesting and most compelling about the fact that this happened in this period is it has to be seen in light of how neighborhood conditions were changing in Armourdale. As I mentioned before, as a consequence for about a decade after the 1903 flood, there was an incredible pall of uncertainty cast over Armourdale. There were people that literally were physically displaced by the 1903 flood who left and never came back. There were people who stayed that were then flooded again in 1904 and flooded again in 1908. There were businesses that decided to relocate. I came across a newspaper article just the other day where they talked about a major uh, hardware store that had decided to quit Armourdale and relocate to Minnesota Avenue in downtown Kansas City, Kansas uh, in, in the teens because of the circumstances down in Armourdale. But by the same token, there were a lot of positive things happening in Armourdale. One of the most significant was in the early 1920s. Sorry, I accidentally clicked on this too early. There was a movement to build a public recreation facility, specifically a public swimming pool or bathhouse, as it was referred to back in that period. And that culminated, started in 1919 and culminated in 1921 in both private and public fundraising for what we now know as the Armourdale Community Center. It was a building that was built at largely uh, philanthropic and public expense. It in in included an in-ground swimming pool behind the bath house, which had shower facilities inside. This was in a period when many households in urban areas and particularly Armourdale did not necessarily have indoor plumbing. So it was intended to serve sort of a social function of providing people a place to bathe. It was also intended to serve as a place where people could receive health services and recreate, right? There was a gymnasium built as the core of that facility. The building is still there and at its site uh, directly across the street, across Pyle Street from Shawnee Park. This was a major movement. There are dozens and dozens of newspaper articles that were published not only in Kansas City, but throughout the Midwest about this incredible effort to raise money to build the center. But there was also other demographic change happening, as I alluded to a minute ago. Starting in 1909, um, the railroads began to recruit Mexican uh, railroad workers to work in the Kansas City Santa Fe yards, as well as the Frisco yards in Rosedale and on the west side of Kansas City, Missouri. And they also worked in the Rock Island and Kansas City Southern yards in Armourdale and eventually in the meatpacking plants uh, and, and associated soap factories and, and other warehouses and, and uh, industrial facilities in Armourdale. The urban industrial population of Mexican American workers in Armourdale was in the thousands by 1920. It was so large uh, that it actually exceeded the population, Mexican population of surrounding communities. We often think about Armourdale as having a relatively small Mexican-American population, but by the 1920s, it was actually the largest population in the areas we now would think of. There were no Mexican-Americans living, for example, in Central Avenue, the area where they live now, Riverview. Um, there, were, there was a small colony of Mexican-American workers living in Argentine, but um, and there, there was a very, very small colony on what we now know as the west side of Kansas City, Missouri, but most Mexican industrial workers were living in Armourdale. They built a church, a Catholic church, uh, Our Lady of Mount Carmel. It was actually constructed primarily by Santa Fe railroad workers, but also workers in the meat packing plants in Armourdale actually hand built the, the Catholic church building off 6th Street in Armourdale. They owned businesses, there were storefronts uh, that catered uh, to, to Mexican and Mexican American families in this period as well. But again, that demographic change was itself seen by these city efficient planners as not necessarily a positive thing. 
immigrant populations were seen as, as unseemly, as having higher levels of social uh, strife and discord uh, within their communities, and with generally not having access to wealth, which is really peculiar considering if you think back at the period, all of the limitations that were placed on the ability of these immigrants to actually build wealth. Um, again, I could give an entire lecture and half <laughs> on, on the constraints of immigration policy at the time. But let me put it this way, there really was no immigration policy at the time. The immigration policy at the time was not written in laws, it was written in acts and in deeds. And what happened was there was an entire pattern for two or three decades in the early part of the 20th century, where the expectation was that Mexican uh, railroad and industrial workers would come to the United States, come to cities like Kansas City, come to areas like Armadale and work there seasonally, and then return to Mexico. And as we all know, my family's testament to this, many of them decided to stay. And they were absolutely treated as second-class citizens, actually, because they were non-citizens initially, but their children were born as U.S. citizens. And even then, as I gave a lecture about a few years ago, they were separated out. Uh, they were not allowed in Armadale to live west of 7th Street. So the Mexican colony, so to speak, in Armadale, as it was referred to, was all located east of 7th Street. All of these businesses, all of the social establishments were located east of 7th Street. And in fact, even John J. Ingalls Elementary School had segregated classrooms. Mexican Americans had to be educated in the basement and uh, eventually a segregated school was built uh, first in Argentina and then later in Rosedale. So this is all happening in a period where there's tremendous demographic change happening in Armordale. But the tool, the primary tool that city planners wield is the physical tool. And so let me give you one great and very dramatic example of this. The town of Rosedale joined Kansas City, Kansas in 1921, again, around the same time. In the 1930s, the city during the depression decided to finally build a direct connection to Rosedale because Rosedale was actually physically very distant, very separate, not only by the river, but by a massive hill uh, from, from Kansas City, Kansas itself. They built what we now know as 7th Street Expressway. You've seen this here being graded. That is the Shawnee Road Bridge uh, that you see on the right-hand side of that photograph. When the decision was made about where to locate this connection to Rosedale, for whatever reason, I haven't fully documented this, but it was decided it should run right through the middle of Shawnee Park. The cannon that you see there was a Spanish-American War cannon, which was eventually donated uh, to the war effort in World War II and was eventually replaced by a Korean War cannon. It's still there today. Uh, but Shawnee Park was rendered uh, in, in half by the construction of 7th Street Expressway. And that physical barrier further reinforced the social separation of white Armordale from Mexican Armordale uh, as early as the 1930s. So one of the parts of the flood story that I will tell, which isn't often told, is the fact that when the 1951 flood happened on Friday, July 13th, as they called it Black Friday, Friday the 13th, 1951, it was the Mexican-American population in Armordale that was most physically uh, devastated. Um, and that really took the longest to recover. Um, and uh, it's a really important part of the story that I want to make sure doesn't get lost. Um, but it's also interesting because what happened is the flood did something that planners had been contemplating, but they lacked both the legal authority and especially the financial means to accomplish, which was to relocate the entire residential population of Armored. And so as you'll see in a moment, that becomes a large part of the story about the planning and replanning of Armordale and uh, a whole sequence of decisions that we're still living the consequences of today. I'm gonna just very, very briefly, uh, because it is the anniversary of the flood, tell a little bit of the story of how the flood happened. Um, Anne mentioned earlier that I, I, I neglected to say this initially in, in the press release that we talked about, but a large part of the research I did back in the 90s was in the, both the regional and then eventually the National uh, Office of the National Archives in Washington, DC. What I was looking at were the records of the Army Corps of Engineers. And I was able to actually look at records like the log books for the engineers that were posted out on the levees when the flood happened. And what happened uh, that morning was really interesting. At about two or three o'clock in the morning, uh, water started rising very dramatically and started flooding baby. Argentina. What are you doing, baby? Um, if you can see um, in this image, what you're looking at is most of this image is of Argentine. That bridge at the bottom is the 42nd Street Viaduct over the Santa Fe Railroad Yard. The uh, smokestacks that you see and the, the what look like silver discs are uh, parts of the Sinclair 
petroleum refinery that's located at the east end of the north part of Argentine. The bridge to the left side there is the Kansas Avenue Bridge over the Kansas River, which was built in the 1930s. And so Armadillo is kind of off to the top horizon in this photograph. But the flood actually started in Argentine. The levee uh, in Argentine broke first in 1951. And there had been extensive sandbagging by the Corps and by the levee district uh, throughout uh, June and July of 1951. But at about three or four in the morning on uh, Friday, July 13th, the levee at the west end of Armadale near uh, the uh, Procter & Gamble plant finally gave way. And the engineer's log entry is very dramatic. I mean, he literally says the levee is boiling under. Somebody just told me to get out of here. And that's the last log entry uh, for that day. By that morning, there's a whole sequence of photos that are now on display uh, at the uh, both the Kansas City Library and the Wyandotte uh, County Museum where you can see this. Water was rising very quickly from the west end to the east end of Armordale. And what started as just you know, a trickle of water, and you can see in this photograph, which is looking uh, east uh, from roughly 10th and Osage, uh, you can actually see vehicles, trucks, and others that are toward the east end of Armordale, uh, where the water hasn't still quite uh, come up. Uh, but eventually, the water rose to the point that all of Armordale was inundated. People escaped, literally, uh, by the skin of their teeth. This is the old 7th Street Bridge, uh, where you can see people walking out of Armordale trying to get away, and you can see the level of the floodwaters. The level relative to the street and the ground level in Armordale was approximately 25 feet of depth of water. That water had also flooded towns like Topeka and Lawrence. And so there was debris, including structures, including parts of bridges, including automobiles, including trucks, including vehicles, and including livestock from upstream that were in that torrent of floodwaters that poured into Armordale. Again, there are films, there are videos of all of this happening. Um, but what's interesting is, and again, this is the part of the story that I really wanna focus on, is the recovery effort. In the days following the flood, there was some hope that the commercial businesses could at least be salvaged, even where they were flooded and their entire inventories lost. But those hopes began to be dashed as you know, the buildings that, that made it through within a couple of weeks were being dried out and being cleared out, suffered structural collapses. And so many, many of the uh, commercial buildings were lost. Um, the exceptions of that were relatively newer construction. Safeway grocery store chain had built a brand new, in the spring of 1951, to much fanfare, had built a brand new distribution facility on 12th Street in Armordale. And the water crested at the roof line of that building. When the waters finally began to recede, there were commercial buildings that were standing, but most residences had either been dislocated from their foundations severely damaged structurally or otherwise swept away. So where I wanna to begin to close this and begin you know, focusing really on the present as I wrap up here is by talking about what did and what didn't happen in Armordale. As I mentioned before, there were profound plans that city planners began to hatch in the 1920s and 1930s about Armordale that were largely about relocating most of the residential population out of Armordale. Within the days after the flood, it became apparent that there was going to be massive public uproar and pushback to the idea of permanently uh, relocating all of the residents. That idea was actually floated uh, in circles among uh, the survivors and refugees and people, as you can imagine, became very agitated, very upset. They'd all been dislocated. They were all, you know, literally people had nearly drowned. Some people had died. Uh, and people had died from the stress. People died of heart attacks uh, while the flood was going on. But they were being told now they might not ever be allowed to return. So the planners tried to frame a compromise. And the on-site planner who had been working for Harlem Bartholomew and Associates for Kansas City, Kansas at this point for over a decade was a young guy named, a young guy at the time named Frederick Robinson. And I was able to interview Mr. Robinson. He was in his uh, mid 80s at the time that I spoke with him back in the early 90s. Um, and he had really amazing stories to tell. I actually told Anne, I was hoping I, I no longer have physical possession of that tape. I think it's actually in uh, 
the archives of the uh, Missouri Historical Society. I donated some of my papers from this research many years ago. But uh, I recall very poignantly, because I interviewed him by telephone, a couple of the things that he told me. The first was that the flood was the opportunity, literally, they had been waiting for to finally rectify, as he had seen it, the dilemma in Armadale, which is the fact that there were close to 10,000 people living in what he saw as very precarious conditions in an area that was, uh, you know, his estimation, uh, not only a flood hazard, but was irresponsible for local government to allow people to live in. But he said, you know, the other thing, Daniel, I didn't understand was the profound attachment that people had to their homes. And what happened just in the couple of months after the 1951 flood is really remarkable because what happened was Robinson hired a local architect named John Maltzby about a week after the flood to come up with a concept for rehousing by building permanent housing with federal funding in Armordale. And here's the concept they came up with. What they proposed was of series, and you see here, there are about 20 of these buildings of large scale high rise apartment towers that would be very similar in form and fashion to the Pruitt Iago development in St. Louis, which actually Harlan Bartholomew and Associates had planned and designed um, back in the 1940s. These were apartment homes that would be funded by the federal government, by the public housing authority. They would be rented to uh, people who wanted to live in Armordale. And obviously they would fundamentally transform the entire character of that residential district. And this plan absolutely blew up in their faces. <laughs> people were aghast at the idea that an area that had been populated by small scale, detached, mostly single family homes, some boarding houses, some duplexes, some quads, was going to be replaced by these large, very modern apartment towers. And what happened was there was profound public pushback from residents that was coupled with legal pushback from merchants who also didn't like the fact that most of the commercial property, specifically the retail storefronts within the core of Armordale would also be condemned via eminent domain and their businesses would be relocated. They filed suit in the Kansas Supreme Court challenging the authority, the legal authority of the urban renewal agency that Robinson proposed to create to implement these plans to actually act. And again, there's a longer story that I tell in my thesis, but what it boils down to is Robinson and Bartholomew and a gentleman named Eldridge Loveless, who was a managing partner of Harlan Bartholomew Associates in St. Louis, they agreed to allow the legal challenge to go all the way to the Kansas Supreme Court because they thought that they would prevail and they would be able to implement these plans. But there was you know, tremendous pushback, political and otherwise, and they actually lost the case. And what's interesting is the city losing their case. In other words, the city being told by the Kansas Supreme Court, you cannot acquire all of this property. You cannot replace all of those homes with this particular proposal. It was, it was argued on the basis of whether or not the city had the legal authority to do it under an urban renewal law that they penciled together and put together very quickly and tried to get through the legislature. But the consequence of that really in the end did not benefit the residents. And that might seem sort of to be a non sequitur. That might not seem to make literal sense. Residents were upset. They wanted to go back to the homes they had known and they were offered something else. They fought against that. Merchants fought against that as well in legal terms. They fought it in court and the city was told, no, you can't do this. So why wouldn't that be good for the residents? The reason for that is because the entire law was overturned. And it would not be until 1959 that uh, then Senator McDowell, uh, uh, who was a uh, you know, very influential politician in Kansas City, Kansas, would finally introduce and be able to get through the legislature a, a bill that did withstand a legal challenge that would authorize the city of Kansas City, Kansas to undertake any kind of redevelopment activity in Armadale. So the upshot of the legal case is that for a decade, 
the city literally was powerless to do anything to help people, whether they wanted to return to their homes or not. And so individuals were left to their own means to actually reinvest in housing. Many of them didn't. Many of them left. Many had lost what they had. They didn't have money. They didn't have adequate money to do it. And banks traditionally hadn't been lending in Armadale to build homes to begin, to begin with. That was as true for single family homeowners like this um, elderly couple as it was for people that lived in the boarding houses on the east side, the Mexican part of Armadale. They simply didn't have the means to go back. There were builders that salvaged homes, that reconstructed them. But from a peak population in the 1920s of 18,000, which had already started dwindling at the time of the 1951 flood, was down to about 10,000 at the time of the 1951 flood, Armadale's population never recovered as a consequence of all of those combined blows. And what that pattern of indecision of over a decade of being able to decide cemented into place was a reality that local government wasn't going to provide a leadership role in deciding what the future of Armadale should be, at least not until the 1960s. And as many of you know, again, it's an entire other story that I don't have time to cover tonight. It was in the mid to late 1960s that a decision was finally made by the Urban and Rural Authority in Kansas City, Kansas, at the same time they were doing work in places like what they call Gateway, which is the area around 4th and State Avenue, Northeast, um, Kansas City, Kansas, Argentine, Rosedale, where they undertook under other urban renewal projects, that the city bought, brought the full force of urban renewal to bear in Armadale. But they did it really with two specific goals. The first was to clear the east end of Armadale, which incidentally happened to be where all of the Mexican population lived, with the exception of a handful of families. Uh, and that those urban, there were actually three separate urban renewal projects in, in Armadale, the first one in 1959, the second one in 1967, and the third one started in 1971 and did not end until 1974. But the sequence for over 15 years of clearance projects what were referred to in U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development terms as slum clearance projects, cemented, again, that message that Colonel Morse had communicated back in 1903, that Armordale was unfit as a residential district. And I want to leave you with this thought. I mean, this really is profound and has a profound personal impact on me because I by this point was a lot. <laughs> I've been born. I'm not going to tell you exactly how old I am, but I grew up in the 70s. Let's just say that. And I witnessed people being dislocated. I had friends in elementary school who suddenly one day the teacher was announcing we're moving away. And I wasn't sure why, but I knew where they lived. And eventually I noticed that where they lived, those houses weren't there anymore. And uh, there were businesses replacing where they had lived. And again, this is not indicated in the merits of the debate of whether Armadale is fit for residential use or not. The reality is a decision was made, a decision both to decide and to create and perpetuate indecision uh, from my perspective, which was that you know, at least part of Armadale would be cleared and the population would be relocated. But there was always the prospect and always the looming fear that eventually the remainder of Armadale would also be cleared and people would be relocated. Of course, that didn't happen, but that is still there and that still has been there. So one last thought I wanna leave you with before I close here and I will take other questions and then we'll wrap up. I appreciate you staying with me and I do this is gonna be a long presentation. But it's important to understand the one really substantive consequence of the 1951 flood. And again, I told you there's an entire other presentation about this could be made, entire book could be written about this story which was that although for legal reasons, for political reasons and other reasons, there were never substantive investments made in rehousing people displaced by the 1951 flood or in rebuilding the local uh, businesses that were dislocated and destroyed because of the 1951 flood. What did happen was one of the largest scale public infrastructure projects that has happened in all of American history and that was the process of planning and building by the Corps of Engineers, the entire system of levees and reservoirs that we know that most people think of as recreational destinations, Milford Lake, Tuttle Creek Lake, Perry Lake, 
all of which are pieces of fundamental flood control infrastructure that were put in place really for one principal reason. And that was to protect the industrial core of Kansas City, of metropolitan Kansas City, specifically Argentine, Armourdale, the Central Industrial District, it was, as it was being called at the time, or the West Bottoms, and the Fairfax Industrial Districts. More, in, even in 1950s terms, in, on the order of hundreds of millions of dollars was expended in condemning land, in flooding towns, in flooding tributaries, minor tributaries of the Kansas River, to provide a mechanism, an engineered mechanism, for preventing a repeat of the 1951 flood in each of those areas I mentioned, in Armourdale specifically. That system has generally worked. In 1993, we had an evacuation, but not a flood in Armourdale. And as you might know, right now, close to half a billion dollars are going to be expended to raise the levees in Armourdale over the last several years. That's actually an enterprise that has required nearly two decades of deliberations. That idea of raising the levees was first being pitched when I came out to Kansas City almost 20 years ago. Uh, from MIT, it's underway. Congress funded that project a couple of years ago and that project is underway. So again, I don't wanna sound cynical about it, but I will say it's clear. Decision makers, policy makers have made decisions. There are massive public investments happening to protect the industry and protect the business that is the lifeblood and is the industrial core of metropolitan Kansas City. But commensurate investments have not been made in housing, in the neighborhoods, or in the people of Armourdale. So I want to close with just a little bit of thought about the Armourdale plan that I mentioned before that's underway right now. In the 1970s, as I mentioned, when I was growing up, there was dislocation, there was push, there was relocation of people. John J. Ingalls closed, was torn down. The school district cast it as you know, a school that had outlived its time published in the Kansas City, Kansas back then. But again, there was pushback from local residents. I went to elementary school with a kid whose mother got other mothers together. And they started advocating in the late 1970s for better living conditions in Armourdale. Their work culminated in the first master plan, so to speak, that the local government ever devised for Armourdale. This is not the master plan that folks you know, like Adams and Morse developed back in the 1870s or even the, the kind of conceptual plans that Bartholomew and Associates had developed in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. But this was the first formally adopted master plan for Armourdale. It was put together largely through citizen activism in the late 1970s. And it has as its core a few very simple concepts. The first is it has compromises. The principal one of which is, yes, everything east of 7th Street in Armourdale is going to be industrial and commercial in nature. And that has transpired. But it also had two other really significant goals. The first was that a hard perimeter would be established, a hard boundary between those industrial districts and the residential areas. The industrial districts being depicted here in this map as kind of purple and the residential areas as being yellow. In other words, there are specific streets like Cheyenne Avenue uh, on the south and Kansas Avenue on the north that industry is not supposed to cross and intermingle. And as many of you know, there's an interspersing of commercial and light industrial uses in the residential core of Armourdale. This plan was in part a response to that. And it was an attempt to basically put a foot down and say, this shouldn't happen further. There was also interest, as you can see in these kind of red blocks on the major avenues, especially Osage and Kansas Avenue and 7th Street to encourage investment in and facilitate the location of commercial businesses that would serve that residential area in 1979. So the geographical boundaries is sort of the second key element. The first one being, again, that industry will get its place and, and have its boundaries. But the second is that the residential core should be respected and preserved. And the third part was that the city government needed to make additional investments and protect and promote improvements in housing living conditions and recreational opportunities within the residential core of Armourdale. That plan for better or for worse has in many measures succeeded. 
If you look in actual zoning map, which reflects a lot of the actual underlying land use in Armadale, it looks a lot like the 1979 plan. It didn't back in that period. But again, if you look and compare the two of them, again, the color schemes are very similar here. This is an actual zoning map that I pulled together just a couple of days ago of Armadale. But this begs the question, if we're revising the plan, why need to revise the plan? Well, I wanted to, to note a couple of things in closing here that I think are interesting. From 1951 to 1979 was a period of 28 years, almost three decades, between when the flood happened and when, frankly, the city finally adopted a formal plan to say what the future of Armadale should be. Just thinking about it, it struck me the other day. It has also been 28 years, right, since the 1993 flood. And I have to kind of swallow hard when I say that because <laughs> that's a lot of time to pass. And I don't feel like it's been that long ago, but time flies quickly, especially as you're getting older. You know, that's a generational change. You know, most people date a generation as being roughly 27 years, right? That's a generational change. And in that time, what has changed and what hasn't? Well, again, the plan, it looks on paper at least as if though the plan has done what it was supposed to do. But again, remember there were three major elements. The first was the industrial perimeter. The second was the residential core. And the third was all of those other investments. So that's what I wanna leave you with is, is a question about what should the future be? And again, that is the role and the responsibility of the consultant team that is devising the new plan for Armourdale. Um, two last little tidbits. I was doing some research for a nonprofit group called Downtown Shareholders as a consultant several years ago. And I pulled together these statistics, which I thought were really interesting. They were flabbergasting even to me at the time. What I was looking at, I was looking at things specifically about downtown KCK, uh, but I, I pulled up some other areas. And what I wanted to look at was, what is the level of overall business activity? What are some metrics, some hard metrics you could assign to that in various districts it's around kind Kansas City, Kansas? Now. It's kind of hot. <laughs> Sorry. Um, what this chart reflects, those blue bars that you see, those very large blue bars, they show up in two of those districts, Southwest Boulevard and Armourdale. Again, you probably can't read the captions at the bottom, but what this says is those are businesses in the utilities, construction, manufacturing, transportation, and warehousing sectors. What is this chart telling us? Well, basically what it's mapping out are what are the annual business revenues by different industry sectors in different parts of town? And what you see here is the tallest bars are those two industrial bars on Southwest Boulevard and in Armadale. Now, again, there's one that would be even taller than this that's not on this chart because it's not what I was looking at. And that would be Fairfax, the Fairfax Industrial District, right? But what I did include and was primarily looking at was the composition of all those other sectors like retail, like food service, real estate, professional tech, you know, banking, other fields. And what's really interesting is obviously we know Armourdale is still a very successful, very thriving industrial district. According to this chart, it's over one and a half million dollars in annual revenue created by construction, manufacturing, transportation, warehousing businesses. But what's also interesting is if you look at the smaller bars, that yellow bar, which is the second tallest for most of these is retail. And I think most people would assume that retail businesses, frankly, as I've heard it said, are basically dead in Armourdale. They're not. And I, I can't go into the source of all the data, but I will tell you two, two things to think about that helps explain that. Armourdale has higher annual revenues in terms of sales, retail sales, than even State Avenue with the exception of Village West. So that's basically from 18th to roughly uh, 88th Street. There's more retail sales being transacted in Armourdale than on that entire stretch of State Avenue. How is that possible? Well, I'll give you a quick clue to say two words, batteries and plus three, batteries and auto parts. <laughs> Armourdale is still a core economic engine of Kansas City, Kansas, and of this region. The question that I wanna leave you with, again, it's not my question to answer. It's a question the community needs to address is, will Armourdale continue? to be a residential area? Will it persist with that uncertainty? Or will 
the city elect to finally make those investments that were committed to and thought about over 40 years ago. So again, a lot to take in. I appreciate your time and your attention. I'm sure you're all hungry. I'm getting there. But I'm more than happy to entertain any questions you have here in closing. So there, there is a question here. Um, are there plans to preserve the history of Armadale by the use of historical markers and monuments like memori memorializing the lo location of Our Lady of Mount Carmel Church? Well, let me let me tell you about the little bit of work that I've been involved with along those far, those lines. I don't know about any specific effort right now to do anything to memorialize Our Lady of Mount Carmel Church, or frankly, other other sites. I think it's a real mistake uh, uh, not to think about memorializing sites like those. I think it's very easy for people to stand back and look at an area like Armadale, and I, I I've, I've talked to lots of folks about this. I and again, I don't. I, I grew up there. Like I said, I still live in my mother's house down there. Most people don't know where Armadale is, what it was, what it is. And they couldn't point it out to you on a map. I've had people, uh, professional colleagues and others that I've talked about it. And then I'll mention a restaurant or something. Right? Oh, you know, I went to Puerto Rico the other day. Oh, I love that place. That's in Argentine, right? No, that's in Armadale. Where's Armadale, right? Um, it has a very blurry identity, if it has any identity at all. And one of the things that I think is really important about historic preservation and memorials and, and you know, landmark and that kind of idea is part of what those do, and again, this relates to the comment I made at the very beginning, is they are literal, visible, deliberate symbols of meaning that tell us something important happened here. It's something worthy of you taking a moment to think about and to reflect upon. Um, I did a project over a decade ago with support from the Kansas Historical Society that was focused specifically on the Mexican American community, but a lot of it ended up focusing because of that on Armadale, on trying to identify buildings and sites that were of historical significance. And what was interesting is we located about and identified about two dozen of them, but we actually had to get sort of a dispensation from the Historical Society to devote time and effort um, because this project was federally funded um, to actually study those in detail. And the reason for that is because typically, uh, as part of what's called a historic resources survey, which is what we were doing, you don't invest time and energy in things that no longer exist. If a building has been torn down or it was destroyed by a flood, you can kind of make a notation of it, but you don't invest a lot of time and energy in retelling the story about it or necessarily using money to create a monument to it. Um, they allowed us to do that because of those two dozen or so sites that we identified, only about half a dozen still exist. Most of them have been lost. Why? Well, a lot of them because of the 1951 flood, but a lot of them, again, especially in the history of the Hispanic community in KCK, it's because they were what you might call meager places, kind of marginal places to begin with. They were old, um, you know, kind of threadbare buildings that weren't, you know, they were either really old or they're not terribly well built. And there aren't very many of them left. That's what it comes down to. Uh, many of the most historically significant sites that we identified in Armadale were on the east side of 7th Street, and there's private owned business located there now. So where would you put the marker? The sidewalk and the public right of way? Possibly. Um, there are a lot of questions about that. Um, I was involved in some efforts with the Kansas City Museum a year or so after that project, and, and one of the things that had been proposed by a couple of folks, which I unfortunately we were never able to put together funding or, or the ability to do, was the idea of creating an entire summer camp or project for high school and maybe middle school students to research the history of some of those sites and begin to develop that. Uh, that might sound you know, a little Spartan, like it, it, you know, it, it wouldn't quite come together or anything, but I tell you, that's how a lot of these efforts often start. There's a very similar effort right now underway in Northeast Kansas City, Kansas, to create a Northeast heritage trip that would focus on African-American history in neighborhoods like um, Turtle Hill, and uh, Douglas Sumner. And that's important. It's an important community activity to undertake because it's only through the retelling and the commemoration of those stories and those landmarks and sites, especially those that have been lost, that we often have any sense of how important they were to people. Uh, and again, one of the things that I often uh, tell people is, you know, uh, reading and studying and storytelling are just as fundamental but the process of coming together to create a monument 
uh, I think is just as important as an activity, uh, as an exercise in community building. So that's a great question. Are there others? Uh, so there's a comment here. Thank you so very much. Very valuable information presented clearly and in an understandable way. Thank you. I appreciate that. I, you know, I try to um, do public presentations like this in a more storytelling <laughs> narrative kind of fashion, as opposed to what I would do in terms of writing. And again, I know sometimes I can burrow down in details. There are always more details than I have time to get into. But uh, I appreciate that because I, I think it's, again, uh, there, there's certainly an art to this. And um, I really appreciate the opportunity I've had uh, to do this. I will tell you, um, this is a good segue into getting back to a, a point that Ann touched on a little bit at, at the beginning that I didn't really talk about, which is, you know, why would I devote so much time and energy to this? Well, I'll tell you why. It's because growing up as a kid in Armadale, I wanted to understand the forces and the circumstances that created the neighborhood that I grew up in. And that seemed to be eating away at the edges of it. You know, there's a, always a sense of unease when you see people moving away and businesses closing. Uh, I, I, I have a lot of colleagues professionally that are thinking about this as uh, there's actually a level of trauma inflicted on people and mental stress by change at that scale, especially change that's about uncertainty and about loss. And, uh, you know, I, I will tell you that all of the work I've done professionally, you know, in an early stage, a lot of it was, you know, historical research and that kind of thing. But these days, it's much more proactive. Um, you know, I work for a large finance organization. Today. <laughs> uh, it was my regular job. Um, it's all been focused on trying to understand these forces and trying to understand the roots of that. And I don't think you necessarily need to understand everything about Charles Adams or Charles Morris to really get a grip with what's going on in Armadale. But I do think it's important to understand that the themes and the challenges and the big questions that resonate with us today have been there for a really, really long time. Again, it was almost 120 years ago that Charles Moore said Armadale shouldn't be a residential district. And it still is. And it's an open question, should it be? And again, I, I, I'm not going to give my answer to that. But, but again, I don't think that's a question that's been resolved. So I, I thank you for the comment and the um, Acknowledgement, I appreciate that. Okay, two more questions. Mm -hmm. Have you been involved with the mural project at KCKCC? I'm aware of the mural project and in a very early stage, I was a little bit involved and I've apologized innumerable times to them because I have not, because of a lot of other professional obligations, been able to be a part of that. But for those of you who aren't aware, um, you know, with new facilities that are being developed at, at the community college, there's going to be an entire sort of anthology of the city. Uh, told through murals that are being created there. Uh, there was a team, and I, again, I made some contributions to the very front end, uh, two or three meetings that I was able to attend a couple of years ago to talk about some of the themes and some of the stories that ought to be included. But there are many other people that have devoted a lot of time and energy uh, into that effort, and unfortunately, I haven't been able to. But uh, again, you should, you should uh, you know, go to the community college website and look for more information on that. I think uh, I, I saw an email just a couple of weeks ago saying that one of the final drafts is coming together. So I think the timeline should be, you know, that will be together within the next year or so. Okay, and oh, a couple more. Um, is your dissertation available to read someplace or online? My, I'm 90% sure it is. Um, I'll have to, I'll have to find it. I can give Anne the link. Um, you know, when I turned it in, uh, even though it was 25 years ago to say that, but it was, uh, we were already using PDFs and that sort of thing. I had to create a PDF to submit uh, electronically and it's archived in the MIT library or should be. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's there. Uh, and again, I will find the, uh, the direct download link and send it to Anne so she can post maybe on the library website. Or uh, do you have an email list for people that responded, Anne? Uh, I don't, but we can also post a link to it maybe with this video on the yeah. YouTube channel, or we can put it on the Kansas Room page on, on the library website. It's an easy way to do it. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, another question, what are the next steps for the master plan of Armordale? Well, I'm not the right person to ask. Uh, I, there Again, we'll also, maybe we should post that link as well. I know that there's a page on the Unified Government website, which was just redesigned in the last couple of weeks uh, for the master plan process itself. I know there have been uh, a whole sequence of stakeholder meetings going on, in part because I've been involved in a couple of those. Uh, but my understanding is that there's more community engagement and analysis going on right now. I think the overall timeline is for the team to come up with recommendations by this fall. 
again, I don't want to misstate that. There's probably a more specific uh, calendar uh, on the website. But again, we'll make sure that information about the plan and the planning process and opportunities for public input are also included on, on the library website. A couple more comments. Uh, Jean Chavez says, well done, Daniel. Thank you, Dr. And, Dr. Chavez. Uh, another person says, thank you very much. It was great to learn more about the history of the community. Both my parents grew up in Armordale. There's so much more to learn too. Um, I will mention Dr. Chavez is one of the people who has been very involved in the mural project and a lot of the other initiatives that I've mentioned. Um, and has been a great colleague on, on a number of these different things. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I, I will close with this thought, which is, you know, I have my entire, you know, family history of, of growing up in Armadale. As you know, a lot of you probably do, you know, you have your photographs, you have your memories. Both of my parents are gone. My mother just died five or six years ago. Uh, my father's been gone for much longer than that. Um, I, I want to leave you with this thought um, because it's actually been central to a lot of professional work that I've done. Where we grow up, starting literally with the house that we're born into, you know, where we learn to take our first steps, the school we go to, the physical environments that we inhabit, shape everything. And this is well known and understood by psychologists and, and brain science. They shape our entire frame of reference for how we think about the physical world around us. And they, they do that in a perceptual way. In other words, you, know, you, you think about how you navigate, you move around places. I still have dreams occasionally walking down the street a certain way in Armordale. And in my dreams, I know if I turn left, that's what's gonna be around that corner. If I go right, what's, that's what's gonna be around. You literally start mapping these things in your brain from a very early age. So it's part of the psychology of how, how your mind works. But just as fundamentally, it's part of your emotional health. And it's part of how you relate to and understand and build relationships with other people. And one of the things that, again, I think is so important, and I, again, I talk to a lot of professional colleagues in the planning field, people who do work like you know, purely architectural work or purely engineering or purely financial work, is to understand that people have very deep emotional ties to physical places. People have very strong feelings about those places and people have very strong attachments to those places. Again, part of your fundamental sense of well-being, and especially your emotional health is tied up in those places. And I think that always needs to be understood, especially by people like city planners who are constantly doing things like intervening <laughs> and proposing changes and, and proposing new development. Uh, it's why people have such strong feelings uh, about you know, change, especially in the urban environment. Um, so you know, I have very strong emotional attachments and thoughts about Armordale. I was telling someone the other day, you know, Boyre is not just Boyre to me. They don't just have great food, but it's the Dairy Queen I used to ride my bike to when I was eight years old. Uh, it's in that same building. And again, you know, that kind of personal and emotional attachment to place is really important. So I always like people with thought of, again, that's not just something that's sort of quaint. Uh, it's something that's really fundamental to, uh, you know, sort of a, a humanistic way of thinking about uh, the physical environment. So again, I want to thank Anne and uh, the other staff at the library and all of the folks over the years. I want to mention real quickly, I'm sorry, I'll take one more minute to this. I, I thought about this the other day. I want to mention several names of people who have been really fundamental to this. And I want to start with people who aren't here anymore. Uh, Dr. Charles Kimball was the retired president of Midwest Research back in the 1990s. He died in 1994, was the person who mentored me and, and encouraged me to undertake this research. It was supervised by Professor Stephen Thurnstrom in the history department at Harvard when I was an undergraduate there. I would not have been at Harvard, but for Patricia Hunt, Bruce Amy, Gary Vienendahl, some other teachers at J.C. Harmon High School, and Mr. Vienendahl and Mr. Amy have passed on. Mrs. Hunt's still alive, but they're the ones that got me into that door. Um, and then I would also mention the people that I interviewed. Uh, there are three people I met, interviewed who are no longer with us. I mentioned Thomas Boylston Adams, who was the retired president of the Massachusetts Historical Society. His uncle and Charles Morse's son, who I interviewed when he was 97 years old, he lived to be 100 years old, Thomas Robeson Morse. I interviewed him in person back in 1991. And then um, last uh, but not least, uh, David Morse, who is Charles Morse's grandson. And I had forgotten about this until I read recently that Mr. Morse passed away just a couple of years ago. Uh, he actually invited me to dinner at his house uh, about the time I started graduate school at MIT because he had heard from other members of the family about this 
great storytelling that I'd done <laughs> about their history in Kansas City and the work they had done. Uh, and then one last thought. Um, this is mentioned in an article that was written at the time I gave this lecture back in 1992. But again, it's also one of these things that really makes all of that storytelling real. Um, when I first met Mr. Adams, he invited me to lunch at a place called the Tavern Club, which is a very elite Brahmin institution in downtown Boston. And I wasn't sure why he invited me there. It's it sort of like a country club type environment. I, I, I didn't think much of it. I mean, he was very affluent, very well-to-do person. He was a member there. Okay, he invited me there. But he told me when I met there, he said, he said, do you know why I invited you to lunch here? And I said, well, I thought you're just being a gracious host. I'm not sure. He said, you haven't figured it out yet. You'll find it out. You'll find it out. Let me know when you do. And it was about a month later, I was at the Massachusetts Historical Society reading the handwritten letters of Charles Morris and the appointment books of Charles Adams. And I came across an entry, a calendar entry in Charles Adams' personal diary uh, for some date back in 1879 that said, lunch with Charlie Morris at the Tavern Club, the same place that 120 years later, so 115 years later, <laughs> we lunch with, his, with their grandson. <laughs> so, you know, history is real. It's all around us, whether we recognize it or not. Uh, with that, thank you all so much for spending your evening with us. And thank you so much, Dr. Serta, for taking the time to give this presentation. It was really wonderful. I know everyone enjoyed it. And thank you all so much for joining us this evening. Take care.